We are very pleased now to have Dr. Than Dang Vu from Montreal here with us. Dr. Dang Vu earned his MD and PhD at the University of Liege in Belgium. He completed postdoctoral fellowships at the Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston and the Center for Advanced Research in Sleep Medicine in Montreal. He has received research awards from the Sleep Research Society, the European Sleep Research Society, and the Canadian Sleep Research Society. He's currently an associate professor at Concordia University in Montreal and holds the University Research Chair in Sleep, Neuroimaging, and Cognitive Health. He is also an attending neurologist and the associate director for clinical research at the Institute University of Geriatrics in Montreal. He's a clinical professor of neuroscience at the University of Montreal and an adjunct professor of neurology at McGill University. So he is a very busy man. Um, his research program focuses on the brain mechanisms of sleep disorders using EEG and neuroimaging techniques. His research also focuses on the relationships between sleep and cognition, which we all know is a problem across the lifespan, and in sleep and neurologi neurological disorders. Last year, his team published a study in sleep which found that participants with IH showed regional cerebral blood flow decreases in their medial, 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 you're gonna to have to explain these words to me, prefrontal cortex. Basically, there's proof that people with IH are different. Dr. Dang Vu is here today to talk about the findings of this very important study. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Dang Vu. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. Um, uh, thanks a lot to the organizers for providing me this opportunity to show you some, uh, some of the findings we've um, covered with brain imaging in hypersomnia. Um, and, so, um, and so, yeah, so I'm going to uh, show you this, this data and also new data with um, uh, MRI studies that we've recently completed. So I'm from Montreal, so I hope you excuse my little French accent. I can't really hide it. Um, and, um, and please, I mean, if there's any, and there's going to be a lot of technical terms, <laughs> I'm going to try to make it as understandable as possible. But if there's really some important question, don't, don't, don't hesitate to stop me so that I can clarify what, I, what, I, what I'm talking about. Okay? So, um, so this is the outline of the talk, so I'm not going to spend too much time on um, explaining you what idiopathic hypersomnia is because you uh, obviously all know what it is. So I'm, the first part would be on this study that we recently published looking at differences in brain perfusion in hypersomnia, in idiopathic hypersomnia. And then I'm going to talk to you about more recent data that we've uh, just an analyzed looking at changes in brain structure and function using MRI. So yeah, so idiopathic hypersomnia, as you all know, it's excessive daytime sleepiness with um, and refresh, and refreshing state of um, a sleep time, a sleep periods, total sleep time is often prolonged, uh, no ketoplexy, no uh, rapid entry into REM sleep, and so no consistent hypocretin deficiency. Uh, there is some clinical overlap with some forms of narcolepsy, which makes sometimes the diagnosis difficult to make, and most importantly, the, uh, the mechanisms, the brain mechanisms of hypersomnia are still uh, largely unclear. Um, so this is a summary, so no ketoplexy, no early REM sleep onset, no refreshing sleep uh, na uh, naps, and no deficiency in hypocretin. So, so in terms of brain imaging, there's been quite a, a few imaging studies conducted in narcolepsy, uh, and particularly in narcolepsy with ketoplexy, and this figure summarizes you some of these findings, and I'm showing you these findings because it's important to keep them in mind when I'll show you what happens in the brain of people with hypers idiopathic hypersomnia. So um, these, the studies conducted in narcolepsy have looked first at um, brain differences in brain structure. So basically it's looking at uh, MRI of those patients and doing some systematic comparisons of brain volumes uh, between those patients and people without sleep disorders. And what they found usually is, uh, consistently is that there was a decrease 
in brain volume in different regions, mostly. So in blue, you see the decrease in, in brain volumes, uh, in region brain volumes, or gray, what is called gray matter decrease. Um, an important structure is um, in narcolepsy is the hypothalamus, uh, because we know that in narcolepsy with k plexi there is this deficiency in hypocretin 1, which uh, is produced by neurons in this region of the brain. And so consistently with studies have found that the hypothalamus of patients with narcolepsy with k plexi is reduced in volume. And so that's important, and that corroborates the fact that these, um, the, the cells in this region are dysfunctional. And, but there's also a, a set of other regions that, were, that showed decrease in gray matter. So this includes um, here, this region in the uh, uh, hippocampus, amygdala. Uh, so some cortical regions, uh, motor regions, prefrontal regions. And so these were, this was interpreted as possibly reflecting some decrease in regions that are linked to, uh, that are related to hypocretin projections or a link to also the, uh, the cognitive deficits that those patients uh, experience. So, so there's two things that you can measure. You can, just, you know, you can measure brain uh, structure, so the volumes of the brain, and, and you can also me measure brain function. And so there's different measures for brain function, but this is a, so, uh, once again a summary figure. And so what um, MRI studies or studies of brain perfusion have found in narcolepsy with k plexi is that, I mean, the, there was also some not only re decrease in volumes, but also decrease in function in a set of region. And once again, uh, importantly, there was this decrease in function in the hypothalamus. Uh, so, no, so similarly to what we found with brain structure. So these structure are, these region are, include cells that are known to be dysfunctional in narcolepsy with k plexi, And also a decrease of function in a few other regions uh, in the cortex. There was one study that found increased volume, uh, increased function in, in several regions, but most studies found decrease of function. But so importantly, there has been, I mean, until very recently, no studies looking at brain function or brain structure in idiopathic hyposomnia. Uh, and so uh, this is why we, uh, a couple of years ago, we decided to run, a, to, to start this project uh, and recruit people with idiopathic hyposomnia and study their brain function and structure compared to people without sleep disorders. So um, for this first um, study, this first set of, um, of results, uh, we've recruited um, uh, actually more than 13, but 13 people who had hepatic hypersomnia were included in the final analysis. Um, and as you can see, there, this was a, they were, uh, uh, they had an average age of 30 years old, and we compared them to um, 16 good sleepers, so people without sleep disorders, disorders and uh, within the same age range. So um, to recruit those people, we, um, we applied the, um, the diagnostic criteria for idiopathic hypersomnia, so uh, excessive daytime sleepiness for at least three months. Um, uh, so the uh, MSLT, so the, the NAP test showing uh, a rapid um, sleep latency, a rapid, uh, yeah, short sleep latency, or a total sleep time that was above 11 hours, uh, no rapid entries into REM sleep, the absence of ketoplexy, and the absence of other causes of hypersomnia. So we ruled out, of course, sleep apnea um, and obvious narcolepsy with ketoplexy. Okay? And so those patients, they, they underwent different tests, but first, uh, just to show you um, the, the, the demographics and other data. So uh, as you can see, um, there were slightly, uh, there were uh, more females than males in both groups. Um, you see the age range, so there was no difference in terms of age, sex, education. Um, in terms of sleep architecture, there was no obvious difference in sleep architecture. Um, besides the fact that hypersomniacs slept longer in the lab. And, um, and also, not surprisingly, they had a worse a score of sleep quality, um, a s more sleepiness, um, a tendency to have more depression and anxiety symptoms, uh, mild to moderate depression and anxiety symptoms, but no, um, but no severe, um, because we excluded those with uh, clinical depression. And, um, and, and, uh, and yeah, so that's it. Uh, we also, they also completed um, a test of attention. 
uh, which is called the continuous performance test. So this is a task where you ask people to press a space bar each time that a letter is presented on the screen, except when the X letter is presented. So it's a basically a, a attention task with some inhibition components. So you have to withdraw your response when there's a certain letter that's presented. Uh, so you can measure reaction times, and you can measure um, how accurate people are. And interestingly, there was no difference in this group between um, hypersomniacs and controls. So there were no obvious difference in attention and inhibition, uh, although there was a tendency to have um, more errors, but it was, this was not significant. I'm going to spend much time, more time, of course, on the brain imaging part. So they, so they slept um, in the lab, and then the next morning, they had a, a first imaging test, which is called SPECT. Okay? SPECT stands for Single Photon Emission Computed Tomography. So that's a nuclear, imaging uh, nuclear medicine imaging technique, uh, during which you uh, basically look at the distribution in the brain of different compounds that are radio-labeled. And you can measure, depending on the compound you're using, you can measure different things. You can measure, for example, neurotransmission. You can measure level of dopamine, for example, or serotonin. But you can also simply measure uh, brain perfusion. Um, and that's what we did. So those people in the morning, they had an injection of the compound. And then they, were, they stayed awake during the, in, during the injection. And then they were scanned right after. Um, so they were scanned in a, yeah, in a state of wakefulness. Uh, and so the, 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 the aim of this analysis was to look at differences in brain perfusion, so differences in regional cerebral blood flow between those participants with hypersomnia and good sleepers. Okay, so, um, so these, are, these are the main results that you observe. So this is the comparison when you compare um, the brain perfusion, the blood flow of people with hypersom idiopathic hypersomnia and good sleepers, what we observed was that there was some differences. And these differences were not like um, distributed across the whole brain, but they were really located in specific brain regions. And these regions are, have important functions. So we found um, decreases in regional cerebral blood flow. So in the, in the upper panels, you see the regions where there were decreases. And these decreases were located in uh, the medial prefrontal cortex. Um, so this is this region in the, um, in the front and in the midline of the brain. And uh, <clears throat> they were also located in, a, you, you, you don't see that as, as, as well, but in the posterior cingulate cortex. And so these regions are part of a, a network called the default mode network. So this is a set of brain regions that are very active during wakefulness when you're uh, when you're um, resting, when you're paying attention, and they are deactivated when you um, they decrease the activity when you reach sleep. So these are important regions to maintain attention and alertness during the day. And so those regions were decreased in the blood flow, so it means that the activity um, was, on average, decreased during wakefulness. And interestingly, you also found a few regions where there was the opposite pattern. So instead of having a decrease um, brain activity or blood flow, there was an increased blood flow in these regions. And those are the regions you see in the lower panels. You see the um, amygdala, uh, which is these regions uh, here. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't point on two sides at the same time. Um, yeah, I have to make a choice. Okay, so uh, this, um, the amygdala is the region in the, yeah, in the, in the bottom here in, in the midline. Okay? So this region is important for the regulation of mood and, and emotions. So these regions were actually increased in blood flow, and there was to increase blood flow in uh, occipital and temporal uh, cortical regions of the brain. Okay. So decrease, actually mostly decrease in a few areas of increased blood flow. So what does that mean? So to further try to understand what that means, we looked at how these patterns of decreased and increased blood flow were associated with um, sleepiness during the day. So to measure sleepiness, you can measure, as you know, so you have some self-reported scales, the Epworth, which you probably know, uh, which is a self-reported scale of sleepiness. And you can also take uh, the sleep latency during the nap test to measure objectively uh, their, their sleepiness during the day. And so what we found is that 
the more the um, the more the, the perfusion, the blood flow was decreased in the medial prefrontal cortex. So that's what you see here in the scatter plot in the in this figure. Um, so this figure shows you the relationship between the blood flow in the medial prefrontal cortex and the level of uh, sleepiness measured by the Epworth sleepiness scale. What you see is that the more the decrease of blood flow was in the medial prefrontal cortex, the higher the level of sleepiness was. Okay? So this means that this decreased, and it was actually the same if you looked at other regions of the, the default mode network. So the more this region had a decreased blood flow, the more these people had the tendency to be sleepy during the day. Okay? So this means that the panels that we observed were likely to contribute or maybe explain part of the sleepiness that people experience during the day. Um, and that was the same thing that we observed when you looked at the relationship with sleep latency during the naps. So it's, it's the opposite pattern because when, you have, when you're more sleepy, you have a shorter light latency. So, uh, so this is why the, the, the look of the, the direction of the curve is, is different. Um, so basically, if you have, uh, the, if the, uh, the more the, um, the, um, the, the blood flow was decreased in, this, in the same region, the lower the, short, the shorter the latency to, na to sleep was during the nap. So the more they were sleepy during the day, objectively. Okay, so that shows about the same conclusion that this pattern of decreased perfusion seems to be associated with more sleepiness. Uh, yeah. Okay, so what about now uh, the uh, amygdala? I, show, I, I told you like a couple of minutes ago that some regions also show the opposite patterns of increased perfusion. And so that was the case for the amygdala. So as I said, the amygdala is important for, is n well, it's known to be important for emotion regulation and mood. Um, but in this case, we also found that the more people had an increased blood flow in the amygdala, the more, once again, they were sleepy. So this is what you see in the um, upper uh, graph. So this is the relationship between blood flow in the amygdala and uh, sleepiness as measured by the upward scale. Okay, so the more the um, amygdala, the blood flow in the amygdala was, the the more sl the higher the sleepiness was. Okay, so this means that the increased perfusion is also uh, seems also to be associated with more sleepiness. So this might contribute also to the sleepiness that we see in these patients, uh, but not only to the sleepiness because there was also a relationship between this. Um, perfusion, this blood flow in the amygdala, and uh, their level of um, depression symptoms. So that's the uh, relationship, that's the figure that you see on the, on the bottom. So the more the blood flow was higher in the amygdala, the higher the level of BDI, BDI is the back depression index that was used to uh, measure uh, depression symptoms. So these so this increased amygdala uh, blood flow seems also to be, might also explain uh, some uh, maybe why some of those people with hypersomnia tend to have more uh, depression symptoms. Okay, so um, now what was really striking to me when I uh, looked at these results um, was that this reminded me of a study I, I did 10 years ago, well more than 10 years ago, in 2015. Back then when I was uh, still doing my uh, PhD and residency, we did a study where we were looking at the comparisons but at basically how blood flow, several blood flow changes when people get go into deep sleep. So that's the figure you see on the right side. So what we observed at that time is that when, you're, when you go to sleep, so this was a study done on healthy, uh, good sleepers, young, young volunteers coming to the lab. And so what we observed is that once, when they, uh, the more, um, the more slow wave activity, which means the more deep sleep they get into, the more the blood flow was decreased in certain regions, and those regions were the medial prefrontal cortex and also the putamen here. And so, if, and actually also the posterior cingulate cortex. And, and so this actually is, seemed to me very, very similar to the, the map that I just showed you uh, for idiopathic hypersomnia. Because um, we are, as I just mentioned to you, the, uh, the decrease in blood flow were mostly located in the, in the, in the regions of the medial prefrontal cortex, the posterior cingulate cortex, and also the putamen. So if you look at the two maps, um, they look very similar. Um, 
So I thought mm, maybe that might be some interesting explanation on why, on what happens here. So one possibility is that during, the, during wakefulness, the brain of the patients, of participants with idiopathic hypersomnia, um, is unable to shift completely from uh, what we observe during deep sleep to uh, what should be observed during wakefulness. So it, it would, might be as if um, the brain is unable to completely restore itself from, from, wakefulness, from sleep to wakefulness. So, the, so basically, in other words, there might be some indication that the, the brain shows some signs of uh, persisting sleep in terms of brain activity, even though the person is fully awake. So that's, of course, uh, in uh, hypotheses and interpretation, but the, uh, the fact that those two maps are very similar, the fact that um, what we observe as decrease of blood flow during wakefulness in idiopathic hypersomniacs uh, was similar to what we observe in good sleepers during s deep sleep, I think was really striking to me. And I think this is an uh, interesting um, explanation to be further explored. And I mean, I mean, this could be several things. This could be due to you know, an excess of GABAergic neurotransmission. This might uh, explain this pattern because we know that GABA predominates in, uh, so in the medial prefrontal cortex. So that's a possibility. So uh, there's a different, there's, I think it's an interesting uh, hypothesis to be explored. So one criticism that I uh, had when I first presented this data uh, is that people said, well, what you observe is maybe just a reflection of the fact that people were sleepy when they were scanned. And maybe what you observe is just the reflection of sleepiness and not of hypersomnia, per se. So to try to um, um, test, further test this possible explanation, we also had good sleepers, um, like uh, uh, healthy volunteers, undergo an acute sleep deprivation. So they were scanned with the same technique, um, first uh, um, uh, in, two, in two sessions. Uh, one session was after a normal night of sleep, and the second session was after a complete night of sleep deprivation. And so we were able to see then by comparing these two nights what happens to the brain of people after acute sleep deprivation, so, uh, so in a state in which they are very sleepy. Uh, but they don't have a sleep disorder, they're just sleepy because they didn't sleep the night before. And so this is what you see on the right side of the figure. Okay. Um, so, and you can see that they were, when you're sleepy because you haven't slept uh, before, you have decreases in blood flow um, in the brain. But these decreases were located mostly on the lateral sides of the brain. So. The, still the prefrontal um, and the temporal parietal cortex, but you can see, this, so here is the, the, the map for what we observe in hypersomnia, and this is what we observed after sleep deprivation. And I think it's not very, I mean, it's quite clear to, to me that it's very different, the distribution, right? So here with hypersomnia, we see decreases mostly in regions that are close to the midline, and in after sleep deprivation, the decreases were mostly located on the sides of the brain. So to me, that indicates that we, this at least, um, we, we, we can't say that what you observe is only due to a, a non-specific state of sleepiness. Uh, it's not the same that what you observe when you're sleep deprived. It's not the same that what you observe when you're sleepy without having a sleep disorder. So what you observe is at least in part um, specific to um, idiopathic hypersomnia. Okay, so um, let me summarize the, um, the findings from this uh, first uh, study with uh, SPECT, so measures of brain perfusion. We observed that uh, idiopathic hypersomnia participants in this sample had a um, disruption of, uh, in, the in the activity of uh, cortical regions, the brain regions, involved in alertness and attention. And these are regions that I refer to as the default mode network. So the, the medial prefrontal cortex, um, the, um, the posterior cingulate cortex. So these regions located in the midline of the brain. And also disruption in uh, networks involving emotion regulation, particularly the amygdala. And I showed you data that, I showed you the graphs looking, um, that, um, sh that indicated that these disruptions were associated with levels of sleepiness. So, so the more the people were sleepy, the more um, these uh, disruptions were important. 
in terms of blood flow. Okay. So what I didn't show you is that is is uh, any change in hypothalamus. So I showed you before that in uh, narcolepsy there was disruption in hypothalamus, right? Because narcolepsy is known to be to involve, particularly in narcolepsy with cataplexy, known to be involved to involve a deficiency of um, of uh, cells located in the hypothalamus. But here in and in our analysis we didn't find any difference any changes uh, in the brain, uh, in this brain region, in, in people with adiabatic hypersomnia. So this indicates that this, this, is, a, this is more likely to be a very separate, a di distinct condition from narcolepsy with cataplexy. And this is in line with the fact that we know that in patients with hypersomnia, we don't have any consistent uh, deficit in hypocretin neurons, okay? So um, I also showed you a figure that um, uh, indicates that there, there, is, there seems to be a striking similarity between what we observe uh, during wakefulness in hypersomnia and what we observe during sleep in people without sleep disorders, uh, which might indicate that there, there could be some incomplete transition from sleep to, uh, from, uh, sleep to wake in those people, and that part of the brain is still in a sort of sleep mode. And then I showed you that this region, that this decrease uh, of brain activity seems to be distinct from what we observe after sleep deprivation. So this seems to be uh, at least in part uh, specific to the idiopathic hypersomnia condition. Okay, so in the last uh, five to 10 minutes, I think I have 10 minutes, right? Yeah. I'm going to uh, show you some more recent data that's not published. It's not published. It's currently under so we're currently writing of the paper. So, so those so people with uh, in, in our sample they were scanned during the morning with SPECT, and then in the afternoon they underwent an, a magnetic resonance imaging, MRI in another facility. So with MRI you can have other types of measures. MRI has a better so spatial resolution, so you can see with more certainty. Uh, you can and it's fine with most certainty the structures that are involved in the brain, but you can also <coughs> study both brain structure because you can measure gray matter, gray vol uh, uh, brain volumes, and you can also looking, look at uh, brain function, but looking this time not only at what brain regions are involved, but also how the, connect how the connectivity uh, is affected. So how basically d the different regions of the brain talk to each other, okay? Um, and so, yeah, this is, this is, so these were the same participants. And because we found this, uh, in, in, these uh, uh, profound changes in the default mode network, so we, the, the analysis was focused on changes of brain volume and brain function with MRI in this network. So this is, so the brain, the default mode network um, is this network composed of different regions of the brain, um, including the medial prefrontal cortex, so this brain region that I showed you earlier, the posterior cingulate cortex, the pecunis, and other regions like the inferior parietal lobule. As I said, it's important, is an, these are networks of, a set of brain regions that are very important for the, to maintain uh, attention, awareness, um, and, uh, and, and, and different other important uh, cognitive functions that uh, are present during wakefulness. We know that during sleep, <coughs> overall, the activity in these regions tend to decrease. And most importantly, um, it's not only the activity that decreases, but it's the way that those regions in the network talk to each other. We know that um, the, uh, <coughs> the regions within these net networks tend to be less connected, so they tend to send less uh, connections, uh, less interactions between each other when people fall asleep, okay? So the first analysis that was we did uh, was to look at brain structure. So, <clears throat> so you have different, s you can, you, you're scanning different sequences doing the MRI. So the first sequence is to do, it's called a T1 sequence. So you look at the brain anatomy. And so by looking at brain anatomy, you can extract different measures can extract cortical thickness, so which means how, 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 yeah, how the cortex, the surface of the brain is uh, affected. You can also measure gray matter volume, so you can look at volumes of different regions throughout the brain. <clears throat> and you can also look at what is called structural covariance, which I will explain later. So when you look at brain volume um, using a technique called VBM, so um, this, this may be a bit complicated, but just in two words, what we do is that we look at the brain anatomy, and then you, you're using a software that allows us to uh, automatically 
um, extract what is called a gray matter, so where the neurons are located, and to extract those, um, those features in the image, and then to do a systematic comparison of those gray matter, the, these gray matter uh, volumes between uh, the two groups, between hypersomniac and controls. And so what we observed was that, indeed, there were some changes in the volume of in the cortex, and those changes were located in very specific brain regions, but mostly in this, the one that you see in yellow in the, uh, on the left side, which is the, um, the, the precuneus. And the precuneus is a subpart of the, mid, the default mode network. Okay? But so what was very interesting is that in con contrast to what we, might, uh, we, we had a thought, it wasn't a decrease in the volume, but it was an increase in volume. So basically, the regions that showed some decrease of brain function seems to show increase in brain volume in hypersomniacs. Okay? And so once again, we look at the relationship between these volumes and uh, how people were sleepy. And there was a very nice relationship. But as I said, it's in the opposite direction. It means that the more the people, the more the people had, uh, were sleepy during the day, the more the volume of this region was, uh, the higher the, vo the volume of these regions was. Okay, so it seems to be a little bit contradictory with what I showed you earlier. Um, so we looked at other measures. We also looked at um, cortical thickness. So this is another measure where you focus your analysis only on the cortex, and instead of looking at volumes, you're looking at thickness. So it, it's a, I mean, it's a technical term, but basically, instead of extracting the gray matter, you just extract the surface of the brain, and then you do a com systematic comparison of the surface of the brain between the two groups. And so what did you observe? So we observed some, so the regions in yellow are those where there was a change uh, in um, idiopathic hypersomnia. And you can see that these regions also included, once again, the, the regions of the default mode network. So the precuneus, the posterior cingulate cortex, and part of the medial prefrontal cortex. We also observe changes in other regions, such as uh, sensory motor regions. So this is precuneus, uh, posterior cingulate cortex. These are sensory motor regions. So we saw that there was also some change in thickness in the default mode network. But when you looked at the direction, that was once again an increase rather than a decrease of thickness. So, so this means that the, the regions that show an altered brain function, they tend to show an increased volume. So why is that the case? I mean, it's not, um, that's something that has been described also in other conditions. And usually it's interpreted as maybe an attempt of the brain to compensate for the loss of function, the lack of function of the, those regions by increasing the volumes. Remember that those people had had uh, um, hypersomnia not for a few months, they had hypersomnia usually for, I think these, the average symptom duration was 10 years. So it is possible that with the years, the brain tries to adapt itself and increase volumes in these regions that are affected in an attempt to compensate for the deficits of function that are observed in the condition. So another metric that you can, do, you can do is what is called structural covariance. It's a bit complicated, but it's, it's actually just looking at how the, the thickness of different cortical regions are related to each other. Uh, across people, and this basically shows you an indication of how regions are connected to each other. And so what we observed is that, so in red you see the regions that seems to be more connected with this analysis to uh, the, what is called the PCC, so the posterior cingulate cortex. And so you see that there's, a, there's a quite a bunch of regions that seems to be connected. Uh, the medial prefrontal cortex, so the temporal gyrus, uh, and this is in good sleepers. In hypersomniacs, you see that the same regions seem to be also connected, but it seems to be the case that there are a larger number of areas of regions that are connected. And indeed, when you did uh, the comparison between the two groups, we found that people with hypersomnia tend to uh, have this uh, larger, a uh, larger number of regions that seems to be uh, connected uh, using this analysis with uh, the 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 posterior cingulate cortex. So what that means is that it's not only the, f the, brain, the brain volume or the thickness that is increased, uh, 
It is also the, uh, the connectivity, um, the, co the correlations and the connectivity between regions that is increased. So that might also be a reflection of the compensation mechanisms. So to look at connectivity, usually people look at what is called functional connectivity. So this is another sequence that we do in the MRI. So instead of looking at brain volumes or, brain, brain or thickness, you, you ask people, so you ask people to stay still for five to 10 minutes, um, not fall asleep, and then, and, and then you measure what is called a resting state functional MRI uh, sequence. And using this resting state uh, sequence, you can measure uh, what is called a functional connectivity. So basically what you do is you extract the response, uh, the activity of the brain in different regions, and you see how activity between different brain regions are correlated to each other. And this is also an indirect reflection of how, p of how regions talk to each other. And so what we observed is that it's not only the structural changes that are increased, but also the function changes when you look at connectivity. We, we, we saw that regions within the default mode network seems to be more uh, connected to each other in hypersomniacs to compare to good sleepers. Okay? Um, so there was an increased connectivity within regions of the default mode network. So you see here the medial prefrontal cortex, you see the posterior cingulate cortex. These are regions that had that show decreased perfusion, um, decreased blood flow. But when you look at connectivity, even though those regions decrease the blood flow, they seem to increase the connectivity between them. Okay, so that seems to be a bit complex, but um, uh, it's, it's actually not all regions that show decrease increased connectivity. There was also some decreased connectivity, decreased connections between the default mode network and the regions in green here, which are regions that are part of the attention network. So these are regions that are important also for the uh, for for attention and attention tasks in the day. So this indicates that. So if I try to sum summarize this re the, the the disruption that we found in the default mode network. We found increase um, in gray matter and cortical thickness. Uh, with we, I showed you increase in structural and functional connectivity within the default mode network and decrease in functional connectivity between the default mode and attention network. So this, so this shows that I mean it's the what's happening is more complex than just a few regions being less active. Uh, there are some changes that happen with time some changes in brain volume and brain connectivity that happen with time that might be a compensation for what's happening in the brain. So the brain tends to increase in volume in certain regions. There seems to be increased connectivity maybe in an attempt to compensate for the, the sleepiness that people display during the day. Okay. So in summary, um, the, I showed you the first study that we did where we, f we found decreased perfusion in regions of the default mode network indicating possible persisting non-REM sleep features during wakefulness in those patients. But in contrast, there was increased volume, thickness, and connectivity in the same regions, indicating possible compensatory changes. Okay? So this is what we, what we, uh, what we have so far. Um, I hope I haven't uh, confused you too much. <laughs> But that's, that's the brain. I mean, that's, it's usually more complex than what we think. So those deficits are different from the ones we observed in narcolepsy. I showed you that for the SPECT finding, it's different because the hypothalamus was not involved. For the MRI findings, it's so different because in narcolepsy, the change in volume uh, or cortical thickness that you observe are located in other areas. That's the ones that are represented here. It's also very different from what you observe in insomnia, for example. In, um, I think two years ago, we ran a study in people with persisting, persisting insomnia symptoms, and we looked at connectivity, and what we sh show is that the, there was no increased connectivity, but rather a decreased connectivity in regions of the default mode network in insomnia. So this is really different. So now we have to acknowledge that at, the, at this time, we have, uh, these are findings on a limited number of people. Okay, so this is the first study, so we wanted to have some, uh, some, some findings, but I mean, these findings need to be replicated on a larger sample. Uh, we need also to, um, to, uh, to, to look at what's happening 
when, uh, when, when people are sleeping. All these uh, assessments were conducted during wakefulness. It would be very interesting to see what happens during sleep. And we need also to compare these uh, abnormalities of the brain with peop what people have in narcolepsy. Okay, so these were all analysis of people with idiopathic hypo hypersomnia compared to good sleepers. So, uh, but I think that those, what I showed you is really uh, the, the first studies looking at brain function, brain structure in people with hypersomnia. I think these data are important because they show us possible mechanisms and possible brain uh, mechanisms explaining the, uh, the deficits experienced by uh, people with hypersomnia during the day. I think they also provide us with possible markers, biomarkers to, uh, to, uh, to characterize patients with hypersomnia and also to follow uh, treatment responses in future trials uh, looking at treatments. So this is very, I think, also important clinically because uh, if these findings are replicated, they might also give us some important biomarkers. So this is why we're actually uh, running, um, we're actually starting, we're going to start be starting in the next few weeks a new, a larger study. We just got funding from Canadian Institute of Health Research for a five-year study where we'll be looking at the brain imaging of uh, people with hypersomnia, people with narcolepsy with and without cataplexy and healthy controls. So um, we'll be recruiting very soon. So if you're interested in participating to these brain imaging studies, um, feel free to contact me. I think you have my contact. You can have my contact information through the foundation. Okay, so I'll finish with acknowledging uh, people who actually did the work because, uh, I mean, uh, this was the work done uh, mostly by my team. So particularly, uh, Sufiane Boussetta and Florence Pomares were the two postdoctoral fellows um, um, performing most of the analysis. There were also uh, uh, several collaborators involved in the study that uh, provided important advice, particularly Jacques Montplaisir. Um, um, so our affiliations and so the funding sources for that, for that study. We, we had received uh, particularly uh, a, a grant from the CP Research Society Foundation to run this um, SPECT study in hypersomnia and also the other funding sources from uh, from Canada. And uh, yeah, this is just a picture of my lab um, and all the people that are working with me to uh, try to advance the understanding of sleep disturbances, hypersomnia, but also the run studies on insomnia. And with that, I'll, I'll finish here, so I'm, uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious, do you, um, do you think GABA-A agonists would decrease blood flow to that same region or vice versa? a GABA-A antagonist would increase blood flow to that, to these um, default areas? Yeah, I think that's a very good question. It's, it's, yeah, we do, we do think that the uh, GABA agonist antagonist might change the distribution of brain perfusion. So and I, I think that it would be a, a nice uh, and interesting test to make in future clinical trials to have these measures uh, as a potential uh, biomarkers of treatment responses. Yeah. Um, first, as a fellow Canadian, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Second, I'll be a subject anytime. I have friends who live in Montreal. Um, third, uh, the, the correlation or the, the differences between the brain images of people with narco narcolepsy versus mm. those with IH. As someone with diagnosed with N2, definitely no cataplexy, um, was there a, a distinction between that? Were the images of the people with narcolepsy definitely people with cataplexy? Just mm -hmm. kind of curious about that continuance, continuum of N2 and IH. That's, um, th that's a very good question, and that's a very important question. So all the studies I showed you with narcolepsy were for the most part conducting narcolepsy with cataplexy. So we have very few, very little data on narcolepsy without cataplexy uh, in terms of brain imaging. Uh, the few imaging studies we had are show that there is little differences in terms of brain structure with people who are good sleepers. But I mean, these were very, I mean, these were very specific analysis. So our hypothesis is that they were people with narcolepsy without cataplexy would probably show a disruption that would be closer to what we observe in hypersomnia. Um, uh, maybe even no differences. Uh, so that's something we need to test, and uh, this is why we're running. Uh, we're going to run uh, uh, this study. Was there any other correlation to genetic markers or any other characteristics of the of the patients 
So, uh, so, so, so the question was: Was there any relationship with genetic biomarkers and other biomarkers? Uh, we haven't looked. We have don't have any um, DNA samples. We don't have it. So that that I don't know. Uh, I mean, that could be. I mean, if you have any suggestion or interesting idea, we could maybe uh, include some some measures for the next studies. But right now, we don't have any uh, any any data on that. 